Thinking outside the box, the astrology of 2012 and 2013. Happy to see you all here. Has anyone heard me here before? Great. Okay. So I want, I'm not going to go through some of the stuff that I've gone through before. I passed around an email sign-up sheet if you want to be notified of upcoming lectures. And um, let's get started. Okay. Common sense. The great Albert Einstein said that what we believe to be common sense is actually nothing more than the collection of prejudices acquired by the age of 18. This really made me think. Everybody's common sense is different based on your upbringing, based on your family, your parents, your siblings, the children you were around, what sort of experiences you had growing up. So my common sense may not be your common sense. So if we all can be accepting of each other's experiences and listen, we may find out something else that is better for certain situations than others based on somebody else's version of common sense. Inner awareness. This is something that it's good that we all focus on how we're feeling about things that are happening. I'd like to do a very short visualization exercise that everybody would take a deep breath and just close your eyes for a second. And at first, we're going to do two. The first one is think of something that happened in your past that you weren't happy with. Maybe a very negative experience that um, you lost a job, you had a breakup of a romance. Um, the passing of a loved one. And think of how that makes you feel inside in your body and, and the frame of mind and your physicality, how you feel. Okay, now take another deep breath and shake that off. Now we're going to think of something really wonderful that happened that made you so happy and excited getting a promotion, a raise, somebody telling you how wonderful you looked, how wonderful you did, falling in love, just whatever it is that you can think of that's personal to you. Now think of your own happiness and the joy you feel in your body, your, your energy level, your vibration. That's the, the feeling we want to have when we make decisions from this place. So you can open your eyes and remember that feeling of joy and we only want to use the first visualization as a backdrop of the negative side that we don't want to go when we don't want to make decisions based on that fearful negative place. We always want to try to raise our energy, raise our vibration to be at a higher place. Okay. Now I want to talk about the normal C bias. That's a frame of mind where you think that's some situation that happens to somebody else, can't happen to me. It refers to an extreme mental state that people enter when facing a disaster. And it causes people to underestimate both the possibility of a disaster occurring and also its possible effects. So here's an example. Place a frog in a pot of boiling water. Of course, it's going to jump out. But if you place a frog in lukewarm water, slowly raise mm -hmm. the heat, mm -hmm. that frog will remain in the water until it's cooked. Mm -hmm. It may notice that the heat is rising slowly, but it, it won't jump out because it doesn't sense anything's wrong. It doesn't sense any danger as long as all the other frogs or all the people are going on long as if nothing is wrong. That's the normalcy bias. Everyone wants to keep the status quo. No one wants to get alarmed. You want, don't want to be different from everybody else. And if you think of our politicians and corporate leaders, they say, oh, everything's just fine, we've got it under control, and we, okay, you know, they're the guys in the suits, they know what they're doing. So people are like violins. If you ever hear an orchestra warming up before a symphony plays, you hear three, maybe three violins hitting one, hitting the same note, and they all get in tune. If you bring a fourth violin in, the person's not even playing it, you just bring the violin into the area where they're warming up, that violin will start to vibrate at the same frequency of the other three violins. So it's sort of an automatic thing that happens with people when they're in a group. Is you want to get along, you sort of pick up their energy. I mean, hopefully you all go around <laughs> good positive energy like the expo, like I think it is, where you want to going to resonate and pick up the good energy of people and pass that on. But this is uh, relating it to the normalcy bias where people will tend to go along as if everything's fine when, when the uh, alarm or something uh, that could happen, they're not so aware of it. Now, astrologically, 
on astrologers to talk about astrology. The Uranus Pluto Square has been happening since June of this year, and this is a, a picture of what it looks like. Here's Uranus at the top in Aries. You can see a little Aries symbol. And here's Pluto over here in Capricorn. Now these planets are, in, there's, you can see a red line with the square here. They're in a square to each other because they're in different elements. And the square aspect in astrology has to do with challenge and conflict. It has to do with two energies that are in different modalities. And because of that, each one wants a different thing. So in order for them to each get what they want, it's not like they're working together like in a triangle, like everything flows, you know, the, the, the triangle, everything can flow. But when, when you take, well, even think of an electric current and you bend it like that, it's, it, breaks, it breaks the flow of the energy. So you have to, with a square, whether it's in your chart or whether it's occurring in transit in the atmosphere for everybody, you have to do one energy and then the other. And then you keep going back because there's a conflict. So the energy is about conflict, it's a challenge, there's usually a crisis because one wants something that the other doesn't want. And then if one can't get what they want, there's revolution. As we've seen in, in previous Uranus-Pluto squares in the 60s and back in the 20s. So these are the dates of the Uranus-Pluto squares. We had the first one that was exact by degree in June. We just had one in September and we have seven of them total going through March of 2015. It's about awakening consciousness. Uranus in Aries is the first, Aries is the first sign of the zodiac. It's about the impetus to start something, to do something new. Uranus is about absolute freedom, whereas Pluto is the power of control and rooting out anything that doesn't work and exposing um, everything that's hidden underneath. It's about life and death. It's about transformation. It's about Pluto now in Capricorn. It's about the corporate structure, government, where we're heading. And this is Iran, and if you look at this chart, with the transits to happening today, you can see Pluto is very close to this angle of the chart. The angles are the structure of the society. And as we know, there's a lot of uh, heat brewing there. The Uranus-Pluto square hitting the angles of this, one angle of this chart. And additionally, as you saw with the transits that are coming up of Uranus and Pluto with the degrees, the next Uranus-Pluto, which is happening in the spring, is at about 11 degrees of, of Capricorn. So by then, this Pluto is going to have crossed over the descendant, this angle of this chart, and it's going to be in square to the sun, which is the, the leader and the rulership of Iran. So that's the kind of a focal point where we're going to see some things changing. So. If you hear something negative happening elsewhere, or some sort of uh, crisis or demonstrations, the normalcy bias is, oh, well, that's happening over there. That can't happen here. Well, we're New Yorkers, so we know something happened here in September 2000. But we can't afford to not be aware of really what's going on. How do we know if we are having our inner awareness, or if we're just in our fantasy mode, or spirituality mode where we're just going to block out negativity. One way is doing your research. Do you hear something? Don't always decide, well, that's really negative, unless it is just really negative. Do your research. Look it up. Find out for yourself. Question your, your biases, your presuppositions, your common sense that you developed in your early life. Just question it. Just continue to do your research. Follow your joy, follow your inner instinct of what will make you happy under the circumstances of whatever you, you find. And just continually do your research till you can hone it and you find source, sources and resources that you really trust and believe and it starts to resonate. You'll find that the more you research, the more you can decipher and you'll be able to tell when something you're reading or hearing on a news channel is true for you, or true, you can tell if it's a bias. When you, The more you do it, it's not like you can say, oh, this person you should listen to, they're always right. Nobody's always right. So the more you do it, just start, and the, the easier it will get. You'll start to hear what's called the ring of truth. They teach that in acting. When you see people in a scene study class and they're acting, and you can just tell it doesn't seem true, it looks like they're acting, it doesn't have the ring of truth. And that, you can start to tell when real people, commentators, uh, corporate CEOs when they're speaking, president, presidential candidates, all that, that's harder to tell because they're campaigning. Okay. 
Um, how do you interpret a crisis or a challenge? So I'm just kind of driving this point home because of the uh, normalcy bias that we all tend to have. No one likes to think that uh, anything could go wrong. So the, nor the normalcy bias would result in inaction, not doing anything. Whereas if you research and you find something's going on that you need to look into or take care of, you can see it as an opportunity to take action rather than approaching it with fear. There's a positive side. So where do you get your information? New York Times, network television, cable TV, internet, loads of sources on the internet. Alternative, who is reliable? I got this on my Facebook the other day. There are 1,500 newspapers, 1,100 magazines, 9,000 radio stations, 1,500 TV stations, 2,400 publishers owned by only three corporations. So when you think about that and you start to hear things over and over, you go, hmm, who, who, who benefits from that news? Who benefits from our believing a certain piece of news? Did anyone see the movie Argo? Yet? Yeah. It's very suspenseful. It's very, it's, if you've seen it, you know, it's, it's very exciting. This is one of the lines from the movie. If you want to sell a lie, get the press to sell it for you. It's one of the premises, and I'm not giving the movie away, but it's, it's really, really an exciting movie, and it really presents kind of the premise of what I'm talking about today. And here's Dr. Wayne Dyer. I'm trying to give you a whole variety of viewpoints. The highest form of ignorance is when you reject something you don't know anything about. So the best solution to that is to start at the bottom and start learning. And we all do that. None of us learn about anything until we, I didn't start, you know, learning about astrology until I was a, a child and started learning about it. So you, you, you take your learning curve wherever it starts, whatever it is, whatever topic. Okay, this is something we're hearing about a lot in the last year, the stimulus. I call this the name game. QE1 sounds really cool and uh, sounds very uh, interesting and exotic and magical. There's kind of a magic in the name that you name something because if it sounds a little too unusual for the average person to understand, they'll just accept it as a cure. And they may wave their magic wand, and there's Chairman Bernanke. I put a little magic wand hat on him. And, um, the magic is in the name, QE1, QE2, QE3. This is what they really are. QE1 happened in late 2008 when the Fed bought $500 billion in mortgage-backed securities to solve the housing crisis. Interest rates were cut to near 0%. Did it work? No. Because we had then had QE2. QE2, this is quantitative easing. Or Queen Elizabeth, as someone I know calls it. QE2. November 2010 to June 2011, the Fed bought $600 billion in U.S. Treasury bonds and instigated Operation Twist. There's another name. Operation Twist sounds interesting. They must have done something cool with that. What they basically did with that is they're buying up long-term bonds in exchange for shorter ones to spur the U.S. economy. Result, increased Federal Reserve in foreign banks by $600 million. People didn't get any of that money. The stimulus, quantitative easing, printing money, easing, printing a higher quantity of money. No more jobs. QE3, this was just last month. Ben Bernanke announced QE Infinity. Sounds exotic. <laughs> the Federal Reserve Bank, which if you, you, most of you have been to my lectures before. You know it's a private bank. It's not part of the government. It's a private bank, bankers. They print money. They will purchase this private bank, $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities from other banks every month with no end. They're going to print all this money and buy all the mortgages. And interest rates will be kept at 0% until 2015. So they said if the home values go up, people will spend more money. Does that make sense? No. 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 But that's what they said. And we went, oh, okay, QE3 and QE Infinity. So basically, let's celebrate Columbus Day with the federal banks walking into someone's house and telling them we live there now. They bought all the mortgage mortgages. So we have now, we're approaching nationalized housing. The media illusion, overcoming delusion. A delusion is, according to Freud, itself something desired, a kind of consolation, is characterized by its resistance to attack by logic and reality. So I'm trying to present some logical things, common sense, housing prices, 
went up, people did not spend more money. In order to recuperate, the patient itself must overcome it. So we as people, when we're presented with facts, and it's an illusion out there when three people own the whole media, we have to overcome it ourselves if we are in fact buying into things that are presented to us that are not so. Person must learn to understand why he does not want to face the truth and why he takes refuge in delusions. I think it's basically we're trusting, we're a spiritual people, and maybe we don't want to take the time, maybe we're lazy, we don't want to learn, we don't want to take control, we want to put the responsibility in someone else's hands. But my point is that may be at to our own detriment. So stay with me here. What is a $16 trillion debt? We heard that number bandied about. So I'm going to let the experts tell you. This is Lloyd Blankfein on the screen, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And then you're going to hear Alan Simpson, who's a co-chair of the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. Are the most aware of the consequences, namely people like ourselves, who are advisors to companies who have to live in the economy. We sure know what the consequence will be, and it will be awful. Senator, if you were in a position now to be advising both candidates, what would you have them say now about the deficit, particularly in light of a vice presidential debate this evening? What would you like to hear from them? Well, I think you'd want to tell them what a trillion bucks is. I know it's a silly exercise. Just say, uh, well, let me tell you something about us, uh, this country. Uh, if you spend a uh, you spend a buck a second, you wouldn't hit a trillion for thirty-two thousand five hundred years. And if you spend a million a day since the birth of Christ, you wouldn't be at a trillion. And the Big Bang theory of the universe happened thirteen billion six hundred million years ago. That ain't even close to a trillion. We owe sixteen of those babies. So start thinking, and then you're going to borrow three billion six hundred million a day every day. You're going to do that today, tomorrow. Every buck you spend, you borrow forty-one cents. And I would say, well, one of you let a peep out of yourself of what you're going to do about that and to restore the solvency of Social Security without letting the AARP tear your leg off or Grover Norquist on the other side rip the other leg. <laughs> okay. I, I believe him. That rings true. He rings true. He's been around. He's like Grandpa who's lived through everything. That rings true to me. Okay. And these are the people that advised the Congress to fix this, and Congress went on vacation. They're, they've been on vacation since this QE3 was announced, I think. Okay. All right. QE infinity will never end. What he just described, how much you borrow a day, well, it's, it's endless until they have printed so much money that they own all the properties, all the mortgage-backed securities. The dollar devalued on this announcement not that there's going to stop food shortage. There, everything, there will not be a food shortage, but everything will go sky high. Inflation will go up in price until you really can't afford food. And then we go over, if anyone heard about the fiscal cliff? The fiscal cliff. If you watch the financial channels, that's all they talk about. Fiscal cliff. This is what happened to gold, which is a commodity, something of value on the announcement. Gold went up $49, 3% in that moment. That same moment, silver went up 9%, $3. And this is what happened to the dollar. And I have some money here if anybody wants. I always bring this. If people always take, I'm running out. Here's your, your fantasy money. You can have as much as you want. Okay. Here's a, here's a fortune cookie. I wanted to add a little humor. Blessed are the children, for they shall inherit the national debt. <laughs> Confucius says, the rich man plans for tomorrow, the poor man plans for today. And here I have another, here's another, I wanted to just kind of drive this point home about Congress and what they're doing. Got the same panel. And I have this whole interview, it's about a 37 minute interview. I have the whole thing, if anyone wants to see it at some point, let me know and I'll show you the whole thing. I just put in some little clips. They really believe, honestly, that no Congress could be this stupid and by God, they can. <laughs> okay. Now, one more, one more. Okay. Uh, when we're back here a year from now, are we going to have a debt deal on the table? Is this country going to be well along towards solving the fiscal problem, or is it going to be worse? It's going to be, you betcha, because the, the, the axe is going to swing. 
and the club is going to come down, and people are going to say to their elected representatives, look, I have to pay more interest because you guys didn't do anything. I'm getting it stuck right and left, and you did this to me, and now go correct it. The American people are way ahead of the They're politicians. They're way ahead. Way ahead of the politicians. They know we've got a problem, and they want those politicians to stand up and get the job done. For generations, we've asked our politicians to bring home the bacon. Well, the pig is dead. The pig is dead. Okay. So, what does this make you think? We're spiritual people. We're trusting. We believe these are the experts, and they know what they're doing, and the Congress is on recess, and these are the guys who advise them, and they say it's not getting fixed. Hundreds of hedge fund managers and banking executives are resigning. They're leaving. This week... You must have heard this on the news, the resignations in Citibank. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're all leaving. The bankers are taking their money and going off to the Caymans or wherever they go. Does this make you think differently about banking? How it might affect you? Do you have the normalcy bias? Everything's fine? Oh, fiscal cliff. I have Jamie Dimon on the fiscal cliff. One, okay, so this is the last one. We are just about the lows of the session right now. One of my favorite sound bites of the day this is coming up. Jamie Dimon. He is ready for the fiscal cliff. Listen to this. We'll be prepared. I mean, J.P. Morgan will survive a fiscal cliff. And uh, I just think it's terrible policy to allow it to get close. Mr. Morgan, and this is uh, the, the visual that they're showing all day, we'll is this cliff. Bad the fiscal cliff could affect your investments. That isn't the, stop, the sound but I was thinking. I think we got more coming up that we're yes, going to we talk do. about from Jamie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, are banks in danger of... Okay. Here we go. <laughs> We're the sheeple. How, how comfortable you are just following the herd and letting this take place is going to, decide, going to decide for you how you respond to it, whether you start to learn about what's happening with the financial system or not. Here's the value of the dollar going down and as the federal debt goes sky high. $40 billion a, a month. They're printing. All right, back to the astrology. Here's the U.S. chart. Right now, uh, I've spoken about the Uranus Pluto square. It is the uh, uh, is right now aspecting the Jupiter. See Jupiter at five degrees Cancer, and we have Uranus at five. It's, it's right now. This this is right on the precipice. And as we see, the economy is a huge part of the debate uh, topics. Okay, now for the election. Here's the chart for election day. Just like in the year 2000, where we had all the uh, recounts and the hanging chads and all the, the political and I um, mean you know, all the legal battles going on, we have a Mercury stationing retrograde on the day of the election again. And this time we have Jupiter retrograde. Jupiter is about the truth, the law, going retrograde. And it's also approaching the Uranus Pluto square that is um, hitting our Sun-Saturn square, which is the structure of the U.S. We have all this approaching where it's already hit in Europe and the Middle East. It's coming here. Uh, four days after the election, Neptune goes direct at zero Pisces. Neptune is about illusion and fantasy deception. We have that occurring. And we also have uh, Mars opposite the U.S. Mars square Neptune, which in the past that has always had to do with a market inflation and a sudden crash. Here we have the 2000 election a chart around the POTUS chart, the president of the U.S., the first uh, swing of the first president of the U.S. In this chart, we have the Neptune, Mercury, Neptune deception, Mercury about all the details and all the exactness of the count in a square, making a T-square with the Venus, which rules the leader. So I am expecting there to be a lot of craziness around. There already is. There already is, you know, with the, um, the, the voter ID, the blocking of certain um, ethnicities from voting, the older people they're trying to block because they can't get birth certificates to get a voter ID. We already see a lot of fraud going on. Uh, Neptune is retrograde right on the descendant in this chart. The people, deception of the people. Here's Mitt Romney's chart on Election Day. Okay, this is his work sector. He's got a Moon-Jupiter conjunction in there, which is basically a very highly inflated and confident position. He's got the North Node going over that, which is his direction in life. He's got a lot of contacts and people leading him in this direction. 
but he's got Saturn Pluto on his midheaven, which is a lot of power and control. Sun Pluto is also about power on his ascendant, his person. He's really going for that whole uh, power play. And then we have Jupiter Neptune on his Saturn, which is false hope, a lot of inflated hope, and Saturn on his moon Neptune, which is pessimism. Then we have the solar eclipse the week after in his work sector. So this is about this, this job he wants. I found a reading for him. This is about your job. And here's uh, Barack's chart on the solar eclipse in his ninth house, which is the legal house, where he has Neptune, which is hope, about all about hope and beliefs. So that was his big message. And he's got Saturn in this house now, which is the teacher, which shows what you need to learn, uh, what other people think of you. You find out when Saturn's in this house, because this, this is the house of your thinking, the third, the ninth is how, what other people think. So we have on Inauguration Day, we have Saturn on his Neptune. And we have the moon conjoining Jupiter. <laughs> Marriage, does anyone see the, the debate? Marriage between one man and one item from a binder. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bill Clinton heard that. He said, did someone say binders for women? <laughs> And here's how the, here's back to the, how the way we think, the media spin. And you can see we've got the colors of the red and blue, the Republican and the, the parties. NPR, National Public Radio, Obama enjoys a Pepsi, CNN, Obama appeals to Pepsi fans. Fox, Obama declares war on Coke. And The Onion, Obama declares war on Coke. Okay. So actually, it really doesn't matter who you vote for because the bankers and the 1% have got all the machines and all the counting and all the lawyers and all. So I, I, I personally don't have a lot of faith in it. But don't go by me. Create your own faith. Create your own reality. And get out there and be progressive and rally for the things you believe in. Okay, the Aries Ingress in Monday in Astrology, which is astrology of, of the country and world, when the sun reaches zero degrees of Aries, that is looked as uh, like a blueprint for the year ahead. So we look at March 2013 to see what is happening for the upcoming year. And in this chart, we see a kite configuration and a T-square here. The moon Pluto is part of both configurations. And the, the trine is in water, which has to do with our intuition. And this is all about the Mayan prophecy and about people's consciousness and coming together and intuiting. So that part of everybody connecting and, and resonating like the violins together is good. It's very positive and trying. But sometimes it can be very passive if nothing's there to stimulate it. But here we have this opposition of the moon Pluto right in the middle, which is the power of government uh, against the people. And the fourth house is also agriculture, land. And this grand trine could also have to do with issues around water or flooding. Um, but anyway, the impetus is for action of the people. Uh, making things change. Here's the Federal Reserve chart, and I talked about this in my prior lectures about that Venus-Neptune midpoint was the illusion of money, the illusion of what money represents, which it, since we've been off the, the gold standard, since Nixon took us off of that, it doesn't represent anything but the banker's toilet paper. Okay, here's the midpoint of the Venus-Neptune is where um, Uranus is, and Pluto stations there in September, okay? Then we look at the U.S. chart with the Aries ingress, and we've got a whole lot going on with that. Sudden events, sudden wound to the environment, restrictions on communication, limits on girls, um, reforming love, Venus issues, which is money, social issues, but it's also some very positive aspects with Jupiter on the moon. Neptune, very artistic, so usually in times of difficulty is when the artists come out and inspire us, and there's a tremendous amount of creativity. Here's the euro in, the, in a, a chart with uh, January 2013. We have Pluto directly on the sun, so the euro's days are numbered. U.S. dollar today, Saturn is going into the 12th house, which is dissolution, which is the ending. This is a two-year process where this ends. And in 2014, here it is in the ascendant. This is a 12th uh, chart, 12th house wheel, and there's Saturn at the last house. Has anyone heard about that they're now trading outside the U.S. dollar as uh, used to be the reserve currency? So you know about this. China and Japan, China and Brazil, China and Australia, India, Chile, United Arab Emirates, China and Africa, Iran and Russia, oil. Reserve currency is no longer used. The petrol dollar, Russia is selling oil. The China is getting it directly from Saudi Arabia for the renminbi, not the dollar. There's more money than people. But who has it? 
There's a good blog that, that um, you can look at, which is the Gerald Salente blog, and there's also, um, he's got something on there called the Financial Collapse 2013, End of Bretton Woods, which was the separation of the, the big investments from the bankers, from the regular banking. So you can look on that, and there's something called We the People Association, so that could be a starting point for you to just start your research. It's a report on the closed banks. We had 417 between 07 and 2011. And as of September 28th, another 43 banks had closed. Did you know that banks had crafted living wills? Due to this year's Reuters article. So that when they fail, it won't disrupt the whole financial system, but the banks may close, it'll be a holiday. And I talked about making sure you have enough cash on hand. Is the mountain getting steeper, the guy running after that dollar bill as they keep raising the mountain. Okay, some states are seeking currency made, in, made out of silver and gold. Uh, Utah's already using it. We've got 13 states, including Minnesota, Tennessee, Tex uh, Iowa, South Carolina, Georgia. They're all seeking approval from their state governments to either issue their own alternative currency or export it as an option. Three years ago, only three states had similar proposals in place. So basically, money, the currency, the paper, has always in the past history represented something of value, whether it was oil, wheat, gold, silver, precious metals, diamonds. Here's a statement from Thomas Jefferson. Paper is poverty. It is the ghost of money and not money itself. Look up money. Look up currency. Go on the internet and look at the definition. These were the highs that the precious metals reached in the beginning of October. Okay, and the overall food price index increased 33% from January 20 to January 2011. People have noticed the food price is going up and the, the amounts, the containers are a lot smaller. So did your income go up 33%? No. no. So you have to find a way to be able to, uh, this is just a very short clip. I don't know that we have time to see it. It's just basically where the commentator is just talking about, uh, he's betting on the reserve currency being gold. Holding. So BK and Grasso, I think you guys are on other sides of this trade. Grasso, if I recall, you like the miners. BK, you, you just go gold. Yeah, uh, you know, only from looking at the recent performance where GDX has outperformed GLD, UGL, it's outperformed both of those names and it's aggressively outperformed GLD. And we had uh, uh, Mr. Purvis on on Friday talk about this whiplash effect when the gold miners actually catch up. And that's what we're seeing now. I'm going to stay long, GDX. Because you've got this double bottom in the miners, right? Yes. Yeah. What about your take on gold here, uh, BK? Yeah, it's not that I don't like the miners. I just, I'm making a bet that gold is the, uh, the new reserve currency and that... Yeah. Okay. Um, worldwide, did anyone know that China bought the London Metal Exchange? Hey. Yeah. They're not going to be fully operating it until after the election. They set the prices of the metals. Okay, China surpassed India with the highest consumer demand for gold, having bought 265.7 tons, according to the World Gold Council. Okay, they set the price of metals, gold and silver, and they own 90% of the rare earth metals for electronics and military. So money is really important for your survival or if you have a plan of something you want to do for it, to do with it, I mean. So really you just want to contrast it, the economic turmoil that's happening now against what you want to have happen in your life. There's a wonderful book that I edited for an astrologer who to me is like a Pleiadian. <laughs> He's this tall Norwegian, Nordic <coughs> god from Norway. And it's called The Complete Book of Spiritual Astrology. And this is different from most astrology books in that it talks about how your soul is moving through life, how each element reacts in any situation, how with a water sign, how you have to move forward and back with a forward and retraction, where if you're a fixed sign, you hold on to things before you release them, and that's why you can get the stubborn energy. So I have a few, I have a few of these left. I have one used copy. Who's the author? Per Henrik Gulfoss. Yeah, he's on my site too. So how much time do we have to get our spiritual and practical selves in order? Some of you have seen this Barbo Index, and this is another indication to me, at least I thought, because 2013, we have a little uptick. It's a lot easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. Mm -hmm. And here's the December 21st chart where we have the finger of God pointing towards Jupiter in the sixth house, which is the house of jobs. It's retrograde, people rethinking their jobs, what they do for a living, what is really necessary in this time, and it's also about food. 
So, grow your food. <coughs> grow your food. It's a learning curve. Time is accelerating. What new awareness will you take with you? First they ignore you. This is a Gandhi quote. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. We also have Neptune now in Pisces, so this is about improving our own personal integrity, honesty, discernment, so that we'll have the wisdom we need to get through this next period. The more we can do this, the more it will become mainstream, eventually creating a shift in collective consciousness in mankind, just like the, the violins will all resonate with this. Focus within when there's chaos without. That was that exercise I gave. Find your center, find your joy, find what you really love to do and go after that. But don't have the normalcy bias. Just keep aware, keep alert, and slowly you know, learn about some of these things if you don't know. And uh, practical thinking and preparing. We're heading into a time where, there, where less has to last longer. Where's Dennis? Dennis, I met Dennis outside. Anyway, the, oh, there you are. He was telling me he was born uh, dur during the, the Depression period. And so he said this is just a part of our consciousness because they had, people born in the 20s had this aspect in their chart. And so this is kind of natural to them. He said this is the world now, the U.S. is not anything like it was then. So it's, it's sort of intrinsic in their value system to expect this kind of thing because they lived through it. And for, for the rest of us, we're used to technology and everything is cool and hip and bright lights. Um, so, my suggestion, have basic supplies on hand, get, fam get familiar with preparedness and survival websites, what kind of work will be in demand. I had this last time, I brought it back again, if anyone wasn't able to get it. It's got all the, the supplies that you should, the, you know, ideas of all the, the things, the top 100 things that you should have, links to these sort of websites just to get you started learning about it. It's got links to financial articles, all sorts of alternative things, solar power, seed sprouts, water purification. So that's the, 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 this, and I'm gonna have some of these at the end, and I also have, again, like I had last time, these little preparedness um, little packets. They have a solar powered flashlight. You just put it in the, in the sunlight, and then you can use it as a flashlight. You don't need batteries. I've got a, a retractable knife. I've got some organic seeds, five sets of different seeds. I've got, uh, they're non-GMO, a lettuce, spinach, arugula, basil. <coughs> A lighter that's refillable with propane, you can use that to light your matches. I've got a candle in here, so I've got the books. You've got your free money. Um, <laughs> no, I thought I had something else. Oh, I've got a couple of these that are smaller. I didn't have, uh, they don't have the, uh, the little flashlight in it, but I've got some that got a few extra. Any, any questions? Okay, thank you so much for coming. Creativity comes about, unitedness, but it's usually an economic decline and difficulty. So the depressions and wars, it goes down in depressions and wars. So that's where we're heading. Okay, I've got the tools here. Come and see me. Single line, please. Can I look at the book, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.